Am I on? Oh, there we go. Excellent. Hello? <laughs> Let's just open with a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this conference. We thank you for this opportunity to come to know you better. Thank you for bringing us safely here this morning, Lord God. Please give me the words to speak and give the hearers the ears to hear, Lord God. May, may your name be praised. May your name be glorified. May the, the name of your Son be exalted. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Well, we're back again. We could get a little bit uh, more in-depth into the presuppositional argument. As we learned yesterday, my name is Cy Tenbruggenke. That's a Dutch name. I'm from Canada. That's uh, spelled C-A-N-A-D-A. <laughs> for those of, those, those of you who want to hear me say that. Um, I've always had a passion for defending my faith, but as I discovered about uh, 10 years ago now, I've been doing it wrong. But I want to encourage you that I'm you up here. I'm just not the PhD. I'm not the uh, scholar. I'm a, a boiler operator by trade, and uh, I just have a passion to defend my faith. And by the grace of God, I think this ministry has been blessed in such a way that I can even come to a conference like this. I hear the preaching up there, and I think, what am I doing here? So I appreciate uh, your prayers, and I appreciate you coming here today. Uh, Tembrinkate is, in fact, a Dutch name, but that is not my qualification uh, for being here. Like the poster says, arguing with a Dutchman is like wrestling with a pig in mud. After a while, you'll discover he likes it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't like it. You'd be surprised. People say, well, you, you must like debating. You do it all the time. I, say, I prefer if I never did another debate in my life. I prefer if everybody agreed with me. But it's a necessary evil almost, and I, I will debate people if they approach me. But one thing you find with a presuppositional argument is they're not lining up to debate you. Because when nobody like me can, you know, have an exchange with a PhD in philosophy and they don't end up looking good, people aren't lining up to be the next one. And brothers and sisters, I'm here to encourage you that all of you can do this. You see, as we said, there is no office of apologist in Scripture. We're all supposed to be able to do it. Um, what I do when I come to a conference like this is I, I really don't like to uh, surprise the organizers, but I teach people apologetics. And that's how to uh, give a reasoned defense of our faith in God. And I say, you know what, I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball. I'm not going to teach you how to defend your faith in God here this morning. I'm going to teach you how to defend your faith that your parents exist. I know I, I love the looks that I get why are you coming all the way down from Canada to teach me how to defend my faith in my parents? Why would that be crazy? Because you know your parents. You know your parents a lot better than I do. So what am I doing here teaching how to defend your faith in God? Brothers and sisters, the problem with apologetic is not presupposition, is not evidence, it's relational. And I'm not doing that to dump on you because I'm you. I'm sitting in that same pew looking for this you know, snappy answer to be able to give to unbelievers. But brothers and sisters, you know the God that saved you, you can defend your faith. Talk about Him. That's our presupposition. Came out with a film uh, in 2013, How to Answer the Fool, that's available in the back. We have it in two formats. This is the, uh, just the film, and you can have that for a donation of any amount. And this one, here's the film with the study guide, and there's a suggested donation up there as well. I'm Canadian, so I can't really sell stuff, but if you want to donate. <laughs> Um, and the film that we just came out with uh, back in February now is called Debating Delahunty. I debated uh, Matt Delahunty last year, last May, and uh, the debate is available for free online, and even on our Vimeo page is available to higher quality. But this is actually a documentary about the debate. It's uh, 45 minutes long, and you can get that for the next, I think, tomorrow the sale ends, but if you go to debatingdelahunty.com and use that code, HSFL, Herald, um, Herald Society, Florida 2015, you can get 50% off. And um, as I've introduced myself, I'm a dude with a website at DWAW. That's my website. For those of you who aren't familiar with the website, I'll take you briefly through the um, entrance pages. This is the new look. I'm moving it all over to WordPress. I don't have this up yet, but hopefully in a couple weeks you'll be able to see the new look of the website. But this is the first page that you get to, and you have to pick an option when you get to that page. Absolute truth exists. Absolute truth does not exist. I don't know if absolute truth exists, and I don't care if absolute truth exists, and you have to pick one of those. And now in the new website, the button actually highlights. So, <laughs> small things amuse small minds, I guess. So let's say the unbeliever comes to this page, and what are they going to click? Absolute truth does not exist. Because they're thinking in the back of the head, you know, if I say absolute truth exists, I'm admitting that God exists. And that's actually true. But what happens when they click absolute truth does not exist? It takes them to this page. 
It says, absolute truth does not exist. Absolutely true or false. You see, to say absolute truth does not exist is to make an absolute truth claim. It's, it's nonsensical. So no matter which button you click here, it takes you back to the first page. <laughs> or it used to. It used to, but I got email after email after email. Your website is broken. <laughs> so it takes me to this page now, same page, but I had to put underneath there. Think about it, this is not a glitch. <laughs> So now, uh, a lot of times what they do, well, you know, they knew they ended up in a problem by saying absolute truth does not exist, so they say, well, I guess, I don't know if absolute truth exists. If you click on that, it takes you to this page. I don't know if absolute truth exists, absolutely true or false. To say that you don't know something is to make an absolute truth claim, nonsensical. So it takes you that, back to this page, and by this time they're frustrated, and they say, well, I guess I don't care if absolute truth exists. And it takes them to Disney. Now, I get people, I get Christians that complain about that. They say, I'm mocking unbelief. Not at all. You know, I say that if Disney was around at the time of the Apostle Paul, he might have said, if Christ is not raised, if what we believe is not true, basically, you might as well go to Disney for tomorrow we die. You might as well enjoy it. But then, you know, they click absolute truth exists, and that's the introduction to the website, so you can bring your friends there. So what I'm here teaching today is apologetics, which is a branch of theology concerned with defending the truth of Christianity. And I want to encourage you, apologetics is easy. I'm going to give you two steps. Read your Bible, believe what it says. It's that simple. One of these days I'd just like to do a talk like that and walk out. <laughs> Read your Bible, believe what it says, because all these passages that I'm going to show you, we all know them. We know them, but we don't take them to heart. So hopefully, you know, with this talk, that will help you to be able to do that. See, what does the Bible say? For I will give you words of wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. That's Jesus in Luke 21, 15. That's not the complexity of the I. You see, John 10, 27, Jesus Christ did not say, my sheep hear sighs, really good argument. My sheep hear my voice. In John 6, when, um, the, when the disciples were um, abandoning Jesus, and Jesus said to those around him, he says, are you going to go as well? And they said, to whom shall we go? You have such a good argument. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now, brothers and sisters, you know, I don't really get too much into the Reformed talk, you know, especially when there's a mixed crowd, but the Bible talks about sheep and it talks about goats. One thing the Bible never says is that goats become sheep. But Jesus Christ said, my sheep hear my voice. Don't change the message to try and convert goats. We don't know who they are, and well, we won't know they, who they are this side of eternity. But speak to the sheep in the hope that God opens their eyes. See, that's the power of our apologetic is the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Basically, you can't know anything unless you start with God. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, that's kind of a dis difficult passage. What does that really mean? In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wouldn't it be nice if after the difficult passages, Paul would actually say, well, the reason I'm telling you this, too bad he doesn't do that. Too bad Paul doesn't take a difficult passage like this and Oh, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that nobody may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. And what do we get? Fine-sounding arguments. Maybe Jonah was swallowed by a grouper. I mean, its mouth was big enough. You know, in the first stomach, there's not that much acid in it. So maybe if he was in that first stomach, then he could survive for three days. We're trying to prove miracles to unbelievers. Our Bible says a donkey talked, and how do we prove it to unbelievers? Well, paper fragment P66. I mean, that's great for Christians. You could have a leather-bound original of the Bible and present it to an unbeliever. <laughs> Talking donkey. You've got the original of a fairy tale. This is great for, I love the historicity of the Bible. I love it. But to use that to try and convince the unbeliever that God exists? Nonsensical. We have books in defense of miracles. We're trying to prove miracles to unbelievers. We're trying to give unbelievers evidence so that they'll come to know the truth and repent. Now, if I started my talk like that today or if I started yesterday, yeah, that's, that sounds reasonable. I'm giving these people truth and arguments and evidence so that they'll repent, so that they'll come to know the truth and repent. That, that's, what, that's what my goal is. Well, what does Scripture say? 
Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Brothers and sisters, repentance comes before a knowledge of the truth, not after. We're here trying to convince people that a donkey talked, that a man was in a fish for three days, that an ax had flowed. If they reject God, that is absurd. But if you start with the God who breathed this universe into existence, of course that makes sense. These people re need to repent of their denial of that God before any of this will make sense. We've got it exactly upside down. You see, God is not the conclusion to the argument. He's a necessary starting point. Colossians 2, verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. We're arguing arguments not according to Christ, according to the knowledge of this world. What kind of knowledge does this world have? Not true knowledge, not knowledge founded on Christ. They have what? False knowledge. They have false knowledge without Christ. Too bad Paul never thought about that. Too bad Paul never warned Timothy about that. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what was falsely called knowledge. This is not new, brothers and sisters. This is not new. This is exactly what Paul warned about. You see, before I understood presuppositional apologetics, I never saw it in Scripture. I would read Scripture and I would never see it. Now I can't read Scripture without seeing it. Something like the FedEx symbol. You see, between the E and the X and the FedEx symbol, there's an arrow. I never saw that before. Now I can't look at that stupid symbol without seeing it. So whenever you see that FedEx symbol, you're going to think about this. <laughs> I hope. Anyway, sorry about that. You see, when a person tells us they don't believe in God, what do we normally do? We give them evidence. We talked about that yesterday. But how does that look? It's a back and forth. You know, you don't believe in Noah's Ark? Well, the Ark was so many cubits, you know, it was so big, and uh, they are probably baby animals and had this much food, so they, you know, only so many kinds of animals, they could get them on the Ark. Oh, yeah, well, how did the penguins get to Antarctica and the kangaroos? Back and forth and back and forth. And um, I've shared with some of you that I'm more of an audiovisual learner, that um, I have all the books by all the greats that teach us apologetic. I read, like, a, a chapter, and I, and I just toss it because I'm bored out of my gourd. So I'm more of an audiovisual learner, so what I did is I scoured the internet to see if I could find an example of the typical apologetic, the typical back and forth. And I finally found um, a good exchange that I think might typify the type of exchange that you might have had in the past uh, debating evidences. You've been there before. You've been there back and forth and back and forth. I don't think they were hurting each other. I think they were moving with the slap, so I don't think it's... Anyhow, you've been there. But thankfully, I was introduced to the Norwegian philosopher Jürgen Hukloki. See, the people have seen this already. <laughs> but um, I'm not actually sure how to say that with all the umlauts and that. Like, I, I have a Dutch background, so I... Actually, I found that uh, Norwegian is actually pretty close to the Dutch, but... I think you have to hold your face like this and say, you're going to But uh, again, I, I scoured the internet and I was looking for uh, an example of the Hulk Loki method. And um, I finally found one. Enough! You are all of you beneath me. I am a god, you dumb creature. And I will not be bullied by that. Okay, there is no Jurgen Hulk Loki. <laughs> that's the Incredible Hulk versus Loki in the Avengers. You see, that's why our, there's a warning with our apologetic, because you're intellectually ragdolling people. That's why we have to do it with gentleness and respect. You're not talking about the complexity of the eye. You're destroying worldviews. 
You see, as we shared yesterday, the biggest problem with evidence, where do you hear it? Out in the world, you hear it in the court of law. We give evidence to the unbeliever to prove to them that God exists. We put them in the judge's seat, and we put God in the criminal's box. But I want you to think about this. Imagine that somebody came up to you and said, I don't believe in words. What would your reaction be? Would you say, oh, well, let me pull out this dictionary and show you that words exist? Would you pull out an alphabet and try and put some words together and show them that words exist? No. You'd give them one of these. <laughs> you don't believe in words. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, who made words? For from him, through him, and to him are all things. God made words. How come when somebody says, I don't believe in God, we don't do that? Now, of course, you know, it's a horrible plight that they're in for, to reject the God they know exists, so we're not going to react like that. But inside, you're thinking, what? That's my dream. That people understand the God of this universe such that when somebody says, I don't believe in God, you think, what? That's how it should be, brothers and sisters. It's the fool who has said in his heart, there is no God. You see, God is not a God that you can reason to. He's the God that you can't reason without. As I shared yesterday, I'm not an evidentialist. I'm a presuppositionalist. Now, I try to explain this to people who are not familiar with the apologetic. Imagine that you put a fossil in between a believer and an unbeliever. The believer looks at that fossil and says, oh, Noah's flood. The unbeliever looks at that same fossil and says, oh, millions of years. Same fossil. Same evidence. Different conclusions. Why? Not based on the evidence. Based on the beliefs that we take to the evidence. Our foundational beliefs. Our underlying beliefs. Our pre-beliefs. Our presuppositions. Now, it's great to examine evidence, but we all have rescuing devices. They're going to interpret it according to their pre-beliefs. And I say, without God, unless you start with God, you can't even make sense of examining evidence. So I don't examine the evidence. I examine their pre-beliefs. And I expose that without God, they can't make sense of what they're doing. See, this story might help, too. It's about the man who thought he was dead. And actually, it's a medical condition. I look, you know, very rare, but the person who th thinks he's dead. And he's going around his house, and um, his family's really upset with this. You know, what are we going to do with this man who thinks he's dead? And they love him, so they give him all the evidence that he's not dead and all the arguments that he's not dead. Nothing was working. It just wasn't happening. So they thought for a minute. They said, well, what are we going to do? We'll take him to a medical doctor. Surely a medical doctor will be able to prove to you know, this fellow that he's not dead. So they take him to the doctor. The doctor thinks for a bit. He says, hmm, do dead men bleed? And the guy says, no. No, there's no blood going through their veins. No, their hearts aren't pumping. No, dead men don't bleed. The doctor takes out a pin, sticks him in the finger. Blood starts coming out. The guy looks at his finger, and he says, well, what do you know? Dead men do bleed. He had a presupposition that he was dead. He will evaluate everything according to his presuppositions. That's where the argument lies. Like we said yesterday, it's not the brilliant mathematician or the scholarly scientist or the amazing atheist who says there is no God. It's the fool who has said in his heart there is no God. Look to what Scripture, how Scripture describes the unbeliever. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. That's a great one out on the campuses. Are you telling me this to, to be true? No, no, I just believe it. It's just my opinion. Well, let me tell you what the Bible says about you. With gentleness and respect, though. Where's the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has, God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? That's how the Bible describes the unbeliever as foolish, as a fool. Now, that's not an intellectual charge. It's a moral charge. A lot of these people are way smarter than I am that I engage. But they willfully reject the God that they know exists. Now, with such an important thing, something that is so important, the identity of the fool, of, of the unbeliever, that he's foolish, why didn't God ever address that? Why didn't he ever tell us how we're supposed to deal with the fool? I mean, it's so important when we share faith. We're so messed up how we're doing it. Why didn't God ever address that? Oh, Proverbs 26, 4. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you'll be like him yourself. What is the fool's folly? The fool says there is no God. Don't address him according to his folly, or you'll be like him. And what do we do? Well, let's put God on the shelf, and we'll use these arguments to try and reason to see which world he makes the most sense. We're doing exactly what God tells us not to do. Do not answer him according to his folly, lest you be like him himself. 
to yourself. Well, you see, I didn't do quite that when I deal with the unbeliever. What I did is I answered him according to his folly. See, God said, do not answer a fool according to his folly. You'd be like, well, I answer him according to his folly. This is a fellow, he's called the captain. He's on Third Street Promenade. Tony will be familiar with him. And he engages um, Christians for hours on hours. And Chad Williams, he's a friend of ours, a retired Navy SEAL, he says, I want you to meet the captain. And the video's a little skewed because I was wearing it around my neck. I even forgot that it was on. But I was talking with him, and um, this is how our exchange went. Are you, are you interested in talking to her? I'm right here. Okay. What do you know, and how do you know it? What do I know? And how, and do, you how know? do I know it? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You don't know anything? Nothing. Do you know that you don't know anything? Not. Uh, no. I don't know that I do not know nothing. So you don't know anything? Yes. Okay. And that's what I'm saying, that if you deny the God of Scripture, you can't know anything. And you agree with that. I deny your God. Yes, but I, I have the right to do that, don't I? Well, how do you know you have that right? Wait. Are you saying I? No, so I'm saying that you said you can't know anything, and you're telling me you're making a knowledge claim. Good, that's what I have. Yeah, but you don't know anything, and you make a knowledge claim. That's, 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 knowledge. that's self refuting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You have a problem with that? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. See, that's the inconsistency that happens when you die to the God of Scripture. Your God is self refuting. How do you know that? Because he invented you. You just said that you don't know anything. That was Chad in the background. Captain, I expected more out of you. And I was on the Apologia Radio, uh, I think a couple years back with Dan Barker. Dan Barker, prominent atheist. And I got a chance to engage him. We round it off, we go with it. Although we all have to admit that we are not absolutely certain. But are you certain that we have to admit that, Dan? I'm very certain that we have to admit that, yes. Yeah, you're you're, you're just saying we have to admit that we don't have certainty. Don't you see a problem there? See, folks, that's the folly of atheism. And people are paying $5,000 a seat to listen to that nonsense. I was a little steamed at that time. <laughs> this is from my first debate, this next clip, a fellow named Paul Baird. Now, both of us, nobodies. This debate was the top nine of the top ten downloads for almost a year. Not because I'm a smart guy but because I presented biblical apologetic, and this is one of our exchanges. I, I think the two arguments that were put back to you, Sai, are miracles and intercessory prayer. There you have two instances where something should happen, and there is a probability that something might happen, but that's as far as you go. There is no certainty. Are you certain about that? <laughs> See, God told us how not to answer the fool. Don't answer him according to his folly, lest you be like him. I answered him according to his folly, so he wasn't wise in his own eyes. Why didn't God tell us that? You see, God told us how not to answer the fool. That's Proverbs 26, 4. But what I did, I answered the fool according to his folly, or to be wise in his own eyes. Why didn't God tell us that? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> That's from the Bible too, isn't it? Hezekiah? I, I, I do that at the youth conference, and they're looking at Hezekiah. There is no Hezekiah. Maybe Habakkuk or Naaman, one of those other books. Brothers and sisters, this is the very next verse. Before I understood this apologetic, that never made sense to me. Don't answer him according to his folly, lest you be, don't answer him lest you be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be wise in his own eyes. Don't assume that there is no God, but then you take on his worldview. Oh, you say there is no God? And you say there's no certainty? Are you certain about that? Brothers and sisters, it's that simple. But you know, they're going to get upset with you. And I want you to think of the analogy of a bricklayer. Let's say you're walking down the street and you see somebody on his 500th row of bricks. And he's putting the last one in and you say, Hey buddy, that last brick? Crooked. Oh, thanks a lot. Takes his trowel. Thanks, buddy. Let's say you're going down that same street. The guy's on his 500th row of bricks and you go, First row, crooked. Hey buddy! That first row of bricks, it's crooked. What's he going to say? What are you telling me? Do you know anything about bricklaying? Get out of here. <laughs> Why? Because he knows that if you're right, the whole wall has to come down. Brothers and sisters, that's what we're doing with this apologetic. We're not telling them that that last brick, brick is crooked. We're saying that unless you start with God, the wall has to come down. 
That's why they get upset with you. That's why you have to expect those kind of answers. You can do it with gentleness and respect and they still might get mad at you. But I want to exhort you, it's not about the evidence. This is from the opening statement of my debate with Paul Baird, and this is something that he said because he was a little bit familiar with my ministry, and this is what he had said. Well, I'd like actually, if I may, to go back to the example that I gave of the uh, use of evidence in terms of uh, proving the resurrection. This conversation I've had um, with uh, another Christian actually last night, and we were sort of discussing um, just what would it take to convince an atheist that the resurrection had happened? And I said to him, well, if we had affidavits from the Roman guards standing at the foot of the cross that they'd seen the resurrection take place, they'd seen the body taken down, they'd seen the body taken to the grave, they'd stayed by the body, they'd actually seen the stone being rolled away and Jesus come out and they'd stayed with Jesus all through the 40 days and watched him ascend to heaven. And that was documented and that was authenticated would an atheist accept it? And I said, no. And that, that, that is really the key. Evidence is not the issue. That's a professed atheist. Evidence is not the issue. If this fellow had affidavits from the Roman guards who witnessed the crucifixion and resurrection, he wouldn't believe it. Do you know what he was arguing in the chat rooms after this debate with Christians? Evidence for the resurrection. And Christians were engaging him. What folly. What folly? You could prove it to them. Still wouldn't believe it. Do me a favor, brothers and sisters. When a person asks for evidence, say, if I could give you sufficient evidence to prove that God exists, would you worship him? See, we believe they have enough evidence. But if I could convince you on your terms, would you worship God? We did that. If you could prove to my satisfaction that God does exist, that God uh, exists, would I worship him? No. Why not? Because he's kind of a jerk. If I believed that God exists, and I believed that it was the Bible God that existed, I would not worship it, because it is a criminal thing. Let me, let me ask this question. Both uh, Jim and Alex. Uh, Jim, I'll ask you first, and then Alex, I'll ask you. Uh, Jim, if it could be demonstrated to your satisfaction that the God of the Bible exists, would you worship him? No. Alex? If it could be proved to your satisfaction that the God of the Bible exists, would you worship him? The God of the Bible has presented in the Bible? Yes. Absolutely not, because he's a psychopath. I was, that was Eric Hovind. He was here yesterday for a while. I was training him in this apologetic at the time. And after that exchange, after that debate, I was talking to Eric. I said, now which evidence would be best for those guys? Every building needs a builder or dinosaur bone soft tissue. These are guys who said, even if you proved it, based on the evidence, they wouldn't worship God. You know, the interesting thing is they wouldn't let me back on their podcast unless I discuss what with them? Evidence. See, this is a question that might throw your unbelieving friends for a loop, who tell you that they need evidence for God. And this is a question you ask them. Which evidence could prove to you the God who says you have enough evidence? God says they have enough evidence. Which evidence would prove to you that God? Logically, it'd be impossible. Because that God says you already have enough. But you, you want to see heads explode and ask them that. But a good lawyer always has to be prepared for no matter what answer they give you. So let's say you say, if I could give you sufficient evidence to, to believe in God, would you worship him? What if they say yes? Some people will say yes. You know what I say to them at that point? You know, you probably would. Because it wouldn't be the God of the Bible. It'd be a God of your own making that requires evidence. The God of the Bible needs no evidence. Well, here's the question. How do we defend our faith with people who know for certain that God exists? Don't believe the unbeliever when they claim not to know that God exists. It will change the way you defend your faith. Now, one thing I want to caution you with at this point, don't call them liars. Because I've done this a number of times, and people go out and say, well, you don't believe in God, you're lying. You know, that might very well be the case, but that's not what the Bible calls them. The Bible calls them truth suppressors. They're suppressing the truth. And now you're talking about psychological positions that are way above my pay scale. First and second order beliefs, you know, they elevate the lower belief. And so don't call them liars. Just say exactly what the Bible says, that they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. See, this is a story that I tell. I used to be an evidentialist. I used to discuss evidences with people. And then I became a presuppositionist, understanding that the foundation is the Word of God. And I was having a dinner with a friend of mine, an unbelieving friend of mine, a really good friend of mine. And we sat down. We just got to the restaurant. We'd been sitting down for about five minutes. 
And he says, Sai, the thing that I hate most about you is how certain you are that God exists. It's the kind of friends I have. He says, how are you so certain that God exists? You know, I could have given him dinosaur bone soft tissue. I could have given him paper fragments. I could have given him the complexity of the eye. But I didn't. I looked my friend in the eye. I said, you know how I'm so certain that God exists? The same way you are. But I'm following him and you're not. You know what my friend did? He got up from the table. He looked at his hands as if he had to go wash them. He walked to the restroom. We'd only been there five minutes before. Why do you suppose he walked away? Because he was crying. Is this man a believer today? No, but the cracks are showing whenever we get together. Because I don't coddle them with nonsense. And you know the interesting thing about that, brothers and sisters? When you go from the Word of God and you don't entertain their folly, who do they go to when things get rough? They don't go to the guy who's talking about the complexity of the eye with him for six hours. They come to the person who gave them the most truth. And you'll see that happen. This happened not too long after this when I was at the academy as well. This was on um, Newport Beach. And this fellow came up to me. Um, we had about 50 open-air preachers there, and um, Tony, and they were training people how to preach in the open air. And I don't really like crowds, so I walked away from the crowd. And this fellow came up to me and said, what's going on over there? I said, I don't know, a bunch of crazy Christian preaching or something. I don't know. The guy goes, oh, no. I said, yeah, I'm one of them. <laughs> he laughed. Nice icebreaker, and he got real serious. He said, two of my brothers committed suicide. He said, I hated God. I swore at God. I shook my fist at God. No God would take my brothers. I do not believe in God. He had a book on Hinduism in the basket of his bicycle that he picked up at the dollar store a few days before. Underlined, dog-eared. He was reading it. He said, I like this Hinduism. I can get into this. This Brahman, this oneness of being. I love this. What do you think about Hinduism? Now, I can logically refute Hinduism very simply, but I didn't have to. I said, tell me, sir, is that the God you're mad at when your brothers died? Do you know what he said to me? Nothing. He started crying. Is he a believer today? I don't know. But you confront him with the truth. Everyone knows that God exists. I was speaking at the Reason Rally, and our friend Chris Sipley, two days later, he was out in the street. Woman, how are you so sure that God exists? Ma'am, the same way you are, but I'm following him, and you're not. She almost broke down in tears. They had a wonderful two-hour conversation afterwards. Confront them with the truth of the Bible. Remember, sorry, everyone knows that God exists. Okay, what about the uh, person, the, the tribes person in Africa? Well, this is a, a quick clip. This is from um, the sermon, Ten Shekels in a Shirt, that Paris Reedhead went to Africa, to these unreached tribes, and thought he's going to tell them about Jesus Christ. This is the reaction. Africa, I discovered that they weren't poor ignorant little heathen running around in the woods waiting for, looking for someone to tell them how to go to heaven. That they were monsters of iniquity. They were living in honor and total defiance of far more knowledge of God than I ever dreamed they had. They deserved hell because they utterly refused to walk in the light of their conscience and the light of the moralists upon their heart and the testimony of nature and the truth they knew. He was upset with God for sending them to a place where he thought they were going to embrace the gospel. He says they knew more about God than he could have imagined. They didn't want him. You see, if those people don't know that God exists, sending missionaries would be wicked. We'd be removing their excuse. But they have sufficient knowledge of the God for their condemnation. That's why we send missionaries. If they didn't know, we should have wall building teams to stop the missionaries from getting in, sign up at the back of the church, have somebody to play music, you know, just in case you have to be talking about the gospel with each other so they don't hear it. It's absurd. We all know that everyone knows that God exists. Think about it. Do any of you know anyone who's become a Christian and says, well, what do you know? There is a God. The atheist can't find God for the same reason that a thief can't find a policeman. He's not looking. Now, this clip here didn't make it into the film, this next clip, because we were kind of yelling at each other at the time. And, you know, I have to be careful with that. But the thing is, there's a big crowd. This guy was heckling me all day, and our voices were kind of raised. But this is an, a fellow who claimed atheism, and he was heckling me all day. So I asked him if he went to the mall at Christmas time and heckled Santa Claus for deceiving all the children. I'm asking you, why don't you argue against Santa Claus at the mall? Why don't you come here and argue with us? I don't have a because problem with, with, with like a fairy tale. We like know that children. No, okay, so why do you argue that that's, that's not we a know, fairy tale? We know he doesn't exist. exist. We know he doesn't exist. So why would well, we... Well, why don't you argue against Santa Claus at the mall? Because we know he doesn't exist. That's exactly right. There you go. <laughs> why doesn't he argue against Santa Claus? Because you know he doesn't exist. And why are you arguing with me? Because you know God does exist. 
I'm just going to, I'm going to spare you. I'm going to spare you one cop town. Sorry, guys. <laughs> well, we're running out of time. So, but people always want a methodology, so I came up with a methodology called the two-move checkmate. No matter what they say, that disagree with Scripture, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. Oh, well, I don't believe in Noah's Ark. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it happened. I don't believe Jesus ever walked the earth. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it happened. I don't believe your Bible. You know what the appropriate response for that is? So what? So what? I can make sense of everything. I can make sense of your objection with the truth of my Bible. Of course, I don't say that. But they say, I don't believe your Bible. Dusty old book written by goat herders. I say, you don't believe it's true. No. Where do you get truth without God? That's the next step. How do you get truth without God? And what are they going to say? Well, from evolution. If they're not Christians, they have to have some kind of evolutionary worldview. And that's like taking a bottle of Mountain Dew and a bottle of Dr. Pepper, as Doug Wilson said, shaking them and opening them and watching them fizz. Because according to evolution, our brains are evolved meat machines. And our thoughts are based on the chemical reactions in our evolved brains. Our brains are fizzing. Would you go to a debate between Dr. Pepper and Mountain Dew? Fizzing? <laughs> Which one of those fizzes would be true? Neither. And this man's brain barf is going to tell me my Bible's not true? Fine. Where do you get truth without God? And that works for any objection. Noah's Ark, miracles, the existence of Jesus. You don't believe any of those are true? Fine. Where do you get truth without God? This is what I do when I go to a campus. I'll go there and I'll say, can you be wrong about everything you claim to know? Can you be wrong about... Sadly, Christians say they could, which is absurd. Because if you can be wrong about everything you claim to know, you can be wrong about that, too. It's absurd. But I'll ask them, can you be wrong about everything you claim to know? And they'll say, yes, I can. I say, you've just given up knowledge. You need to repent and put your trust in Jesus Christ. I say, what are you talking about? I could be right. I say, well, let me say, you know, you asked me the speed of the road out there. I say, it's 30 miles per hour, but I could be wrong. Do I know it? Not if I could be wrong. And if you could be wrong about everything, it follows that you know nothing. So what do they say? So can you. I've done this at Harvard, Yale. I say, you don't go to Harvard, Yale, you go to so can you. <laughs> Here's the problem. If they can be wrong about everything and they say, so can you, what's that? That's a knowledge claim. They say they can be wrong about everything they claim to know, and the very next thing out of their mouth is a knowledge claim about you. Well, so can you. If you can be wrong about everything, how can you know what I can be wrong about? I'm going to get shirts made like that. So what do they say? I say, how do you know? How do you know? Unless you start with God, how do you know? How do you know? I argue like a two-year-old. You're arguing, your argument is childish, son. You're an adult, your argument is childish. Yeah, that's happened before. So what if there's a spirituality that says rape your children story? Did you ever bring that up? No. But I don't know. You have to embrace truth. What if there's a spirituality? But truth is just a word. It you just wrong represents about that? something. Could you be wrong Could about you be wrong that? About that? No. <laughs> yeah. You're, 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 you're regression. It's just, a, I think, childish. You think it's childish? Yeah, you're regression. Yeah, I think you're a little childish. You, you think it's childish? You know what's sad about that? Two people at a university cannot defeat the argument of a child. You think it's childish? I don't care. <laughs> it's childlike. It's that simple, and they cannot defeat it. But brothers and sisters, we talk about evidences and presuppositions. Argue from the truth of Scripture. Know your Bible. Argue according to it. That's what closes mouths. But as closing here, I just want to... My six-point closing? No. In closing, I want to talk to you about the real problem with apologetics. It's not evidences. It's not presuppositions. It's Chad Williams. <laughs> now Chad is a good friend of mine. Chad used to work with Tony. And uh, Chad is a retired Navy SEAL. I don't want to give too much of the story away. But Chad was a quitter. Everything he did, he quit. He had some you know, skateboarding commercials that he was in, and he quit that. He's going to school. Quit that. Why did he quit that? He told his dad he's going to be a Navy SEAL. Quit school, and his father said, oh, no. You're going to be scraping paint off boats in Japan. You're not going to be a Navy SEAL. You're going to quit that too, Chad. So what did his father do? His father loved his son so much that he um, got his fellow out of the Yellow Pages, so his name is Scott Helvenston. And um, he asked Scott to take his son for a workout as a retired Navy SEAL. This guy was a Navy SEAL of Navy SEALs, the youngest ever holds records that still exist today. And he said, will you take my son for a workout to beat his desire out of him to become a Navy SEAL? And he did. 
took him for a workout. Tough workout. But one thing happened that none of them expected. Chad kept up with them. Chad kept up with them, and Scott reported back to Chad's father. He said, I got some bad news for you. I think he has what it takes. Chad did become a Navy SEAL. Scott took him under his wing. That's him firing a Carl Gustav anti-attack rocket. He preaches now. He has a book out, The Seal of God, and works for a ministry, telling his story, telling how he became a Christian. He did become a Navy SEAL, but as he was preparing, Scott asked him, he said, Chad, I'm kind of running out of money. They have a Blackwater operations that they can go back to Iraq and um, make all kinds of money, you know, being a private security firm, should I go? And Chad says, yeah, go kick some butt. Go over there, kick some butt. He's all right. So he goes back to Iraq. And Chad, he's in his uh, training to become a Navy SEAL, you know, just before boot camp. And he did Scott Helvinston's workouts. And Scott Helvinston was a, a very popular, you know, well-known Navy SEAL. He had his own workout tape. So Chad had this tape. And he went to put it in the VCR. That's what we had back the tapes. You know, I guess we don't have that anymore. Turned his television on. He's about to put this tape in. And he looks and he sees Scott's picture on TV. He says, oh, Scott. I wonder what he's being interviewed for now. Then on the bottom of the screen, he saw something different that shocked him. The date of his birth and the date of his death. Scott Helveston was one of those Marines, uh, one of those Navy SEALs, retired, who was ambushed. And his body was dragged out in Fallujah, down the streets, dismembered, burnt, hung from the Euphrates River Bridge. Chad's mentor brutally murdered him. Chad saw that, and he had a passion to become a Navy SEAL. Now, I want you to think about something here. Chad, uh, Scott Helen was 39 when he was murdered. I want you to think about this. Chad is in ministry now. I want you to imagine that he goes to a restaurant with a ministry, with a group. And there's somebody in that ministry who's in his 30s and he's still single. And he said to that fellow, how come you're still single? And the guy says, well, Chad's friend Scott gave up his life in his 30s and I want to be just like him. And everybody laughed. How do you think Chad would react? There'd probably be a fight. Chad's a mild-mannered guy. He'd pro there'd probably be a fight. Not only are they denigrating marriage, comparing it to death, ha, 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 but they're making fun of his father figure, of his hero. But brothers and sisters, that part of the story is not true. It wasn't Chad in the restaurant. It was me. And I went out with a group from a ministry and there's a fellow in his 30s who's still single. And they said, how come you're still single? He said, Jesus gave up his life in his 30s, and I want to be just like him. And everybody laughed. And they're going to go out and preach Christ crucified? I don't believe you. I don't believe you. And I was there stunned. But it's worse than that. I went to an outreach with over 100 open-air preachers. And the lawyers telling us where we're allowed to preach... And he gets up and he tells a joke, and I encourage you not to laugh when I tell you what he said, because I tell this even at conferences like this, and somebody's chuckling about it. But he said there was a man who was on his deathbed, and he had a chair on either side of his bed, and he wanted an IRS agent and a lawyer on either side. And they didn't know what they were doing here. The man's about to die. He said, what are we doing here? Jesus Christ died between two thieves. I want to be just like him. Over a hundred open-air preachers burst out laughing, and they're going to get on a box that day and preach Christ crucified? I don't believe you. Brothers and sisters, that's the problem with apologetics. We ignore what our Savior has done for us. And you know, it's, it's not only that. Every time I sin, I do the same thing. I laugh at the crucifixion of Christ. And I'm going to get on a box and preach Christ crucified. Brothers and sisters, if we're going to share our faith. Honor Jesus Christ as Lord. You can defend your faith. You've been equipped to do it. You've been commanded to do it, and you've been equipped. Brothers and sisters, apologetics is easy. Read your Bible. Believe what it says. That's the power of apologetic. Honor Jesus Christ as Lord. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for this time that we could share together. Help us to go forth, Lord God, to honor Jesus Christ as Lord. That people might see us and want what we have. Not in a friendship way, Lord God, but to desire what we have, Lord God. That your Son gave his life for even us. We thank you for this time. We ask that you bless the rest of this conference. Lord God, we praise you in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.